I'm afraid uh, you won't have a PowerPoint presentation. Gandhi believed that power corrupts. And, <laughs> and I believe that PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. I've never given a talk, or I've given many talks with the PowerPoint. Um, I crave your indulgence uh, for several footnotes I have, which I want to say in the beginning to set the scene. Uh, to, uh, before I begin my main subject, uh, on main subject, it's a kind of conversation that I'm having with about 30 people who are registered on Zoom, and of course, friends like yourself. So it's it's a kind of um, starting a conversation on what I I personally consider a very uh, important topic, particularly in the situation we are today, from uh, Europe to to Australia. To Fiji and India. Let me say, pay my respect to the elders of uh, Nanawa people here, and of course also the elders of ANU uh, who taught me. Canberra is a good place to begin a journey into Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi's growth into a Mahatma, the great soul. After all, he began his experiments in and with truth in South Africa. And who knows, truth today may have found shelter in Uluru, the Southern Rock, bigger, older than any human heart. Gandhi did believe in changing the landscape of the heart and soul. That he succeeded to an extraordinary extent, I think is the miracle of the first half of the genocidal 20th century, perhaps the most memorable and magnificent achievement of a single and singular soul through Satyagraha, the force of the firmness of truth that he believed in more than anyone else. And he wanted that message uh, to go in South Africa, to India, to the world. The Mahatma was assassinated in New Delhi on 30th January, 1948, soon after a brutally partitioned India gained her independence from the British. The vivisection with the connivance of the imperial power was bloody. Historians have defined it as, and I quote, the greatest imperial crime in history. It will be centuries before its true significance is seen and felt in the body politics of generations yet unborn beyond the broken shores and the inner contours of the subcontinent itself. The Mahatma was killed by a deluded youth barely six months after, three bullets uh, later, three bullets, six months later, three bullets in his frail body, two words on his fasted lips. Ironically named Godson, the young man has been called a madman, an extremist, a terrorist, a murderer, a religious fanatic, and a patriot. Gandhi wouldn't have used any of these terms for his, for his hand was always uplifted over hate. He would have blamed himself for the violent act of Nathuram Godse, that is the, that was the name of the young man who was hanged in 1949. And if, and if he had survived, he would have whipped Young man, you wasted two bullets too many, my friend. Excellence for him was not wasting anything, not even bullets. New Delhi was conceived almost at the same time as Canberra. Both cities grew out of the colonial imagination. Of course, we all know the architect of Canberra, the architect of Canberra, the original person, had died a decade before in 1937 in Lucknow. Walter Burley Griffin's grave is in that city, not far from New Delhi, where the Mahatma was murdered. But for our purpose tonight, there are other connections. Gandhi in his long, long life of struggles and failures, trials and triumphs, fasts and fads, complexities and contradictions amidst colonial cruelties and caste staggering injustice, communal atrocities and racial brutalities touch many minds and innumerable hearts. 
from peasants to princesses, kings and queens, viceroy to vicious villains in islands and on continents. Here, even as far back as 1939, Patrick White published his first novel, Happy Valley. He chose an epigraph from a Gandhi essay on suffering written in 1922, exactly a century ago today. Suffering is the recurring leitmotif of White's subsequent great fiction and other writings. The purer the suffering, the greater is the progress, he told Gandhi. Like Gautama Buddha, Mohandas Gandhi understood the true meaning of human suffering and his every act was towards removing that tear from every eye in the lost, the loneliness, and the lowest. In several essays and public conversations, our only literary Nobel laureate puts the Mahatma in the company of the Buddha and Jesus Christ and other prophets from the deserts. Gandhi was a rider in the chariot. In, all, in it, all fates, are defined as one and the same. And I'm of course referring to the great novel writers in the cherry by Patrick White. Yet I feel Mohandas K. Gandhi was different from all of them. He was so deeply human, so profoundly flawed with no claim to divinity, but he believed fervently that every human being is potentially divine. And there is a spirit that is part of life in any form and shape face in place. It is the spirit of truth and love, God-given qualities. It is a spark that can be ignited with the fire of love. The flame, uh, the flame and the rose are inseparable in our blundering humanity and inhumanity. And for the world, and the world is suffused with the splendor of that spirit which rolls through all things. I'm sure my dear friend here, um, Professor Will Christie will understand where that quote is from. Uh, several scholars in Australia have been interested in Gandhi's extraordinary active life of almost 60 years on, on the three continents. Two books, one, Gandhi's, uh, one on Gandhi's ashrams and the other on the magnetic salt march in 1930 have been written by Mark Thomas and Mark Weber respectively and both had connections with Canberra. However, the most comprehensive analysis of Gandhi's ideas, concepts, and practice of religion and its transformation through a single life is by our own, the late Professor J.T. of Jordans, who established the first Department of Indian Studies at Melbourne University in 1961 and joined the ANU in 1982 as a dean with Professor A.L. Bashan. I had the pleasure of knowing both of them. Uh, I remember taking Professor Basham to a long Indian movie and it was for three and a half hours. At the end of it, uh, he, I asked him, I said, what did you think of the movie, Professor Basham? He simply looked at me and said, the old man took a long time dying, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. His richly researched volume, Gandhi's Religion, first published in 1998, I chanced upon it in Fishwick the other day, Fishwick Market, where there is a bookstore run by Lifeline. If you haven't visited it, please do. The latest publication in Canberra earlier this year is titled Gandhi's Truths in an Age of Fundamentalism and Nationalism. The volume contains papers presented at the symposium held at the Australian Center for Christianity and Culture, Barton Campus, CSU, marking the 150th anniversary of the Mahatma three years ago. It was organized by the then executive director, Professor Stephen Picard and Professor Santi Clark from Wesley College, Washington. I too played a small role in, the, in its organization and discovered two very dear friends. Further, one day while visiting my late friend and former vice chancellor of the University of Canberra, Professor Dom Aitken, I saw the name of a C, the CEO of Pine Residence, one Mr. Nirinjan Krishna Agdua. I didn't know him, but, but knew that he was mainly responsible for the Gandhi statue in Glee Park in, in Civic. Luckily, I had a copy of my little volume, Gandhi Anjali, in my bag. I left a copy of this in his office. A few days later, I heard from him, much to my delight, 
He's a deeply dedicated, he's deeply dedicated to spreading the message of the Mahatma from here to Fiji. He has now founded the Mahatma Gandhi Society in Australia. Thanks to him, a Gandhi symposium will be held in the, our federal parliament on October 12th, and Ms. Agarwal is here. Although another footnote in 1987, the Indian Cricket Board decided to build two statues in Kolkata's Eden Gardens, one of Don Bradman, the other of Mahatma Gandhi. Sadly, the Don fell ill and couldn't travel. Imagine the great Don and the great soul standing together, watching some very dubious decisions given by umpires trained in the empire. I think it was a fortunate piece of misfortune that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Don Bradman couldn't go to Calcutta. Finally, there was a conference held at HRC in 2004 in the shadow of the Iraq war, Gandhi and the nonviolent relationality global perspectives. Selected papers edited by Dev Jani Ganguly and John Docker were published. Both editors have had lasting connections with the HRC and John Docker had just sent me his three volume autobiography. So now to my protein theme of the evening, Gandhi's religion. I have, although this topic was given to me by Ibrahim, uh, I accepted it without realizing how much uh, work I have to do. So I gave it a slightly extended title, Searching for the Soul of, uh, Searching for the Great Soul. And of course, if Ibrahim, Ibrahim, that kind of name asks you to do something, you just cannot say no to him. He's got a very prophetic name. Gandhi's religion is oceanic, vast and varied, complex and contradictory, and forever in, con in collusion, a collision with waves in the sea. But like the Ganges, it has a powerful flow through the pollution of politics and misrepresentations, critically curious scrutiny of, uh, of his many experiments. And when you search for a river source, you will find these infinite springs from which it takes its origins and flows toward the ocean. So are the beginnings and end of individuals. The Mahatma's many texts and acts shaped his religious view of a changing life in, a daily, in daily living. We are not rooted like trees. We flow like ever changing waters, dreaming and streaming and accepting thoughts from many rivulets as well. Gandhi was an original, but he copied ideas from many sources that were available to him from the East and the West, from the North and the South, from the pro prophetic deserts and the gods and sages on the snow peaks of the Himalayas. But above all, in the soil, salt and soul of the subcontinent, where he experimented with his sublime beliefs among his people, with his deep sense of humanity and decency and humility. The man was and is the message. Gandhi's religious faith was creative and embracing in a long life of action and contemplation, silence and conversation, reading and writing, in jail and in the street, in jail and on the streets, while fighting for more than political freedom. It's great epic of love. It's a great epic of love in an era of imprisoning racial violence, revolutionary ideas, communal hatred, and imperial mischief. During his lifetime, Gandhi experienced the British Empire, South Africa, two world wars, the Holocaust and Hiroshima, the partition of India, and several violent revolutions, and many personal losses of family and friends, including his wife, Kasturba. Peter Marisburg is a small city about 80 kilometers from Durban. When I visited it in 1996, the railway station was desolate with a few dim lights glowing on that darkening railway platform. The day coincided with the commemoration of Winston Churchill's escape as a prisoner of the Boers. Nelson Mandela was the president of South Africa and chaired the Chogam meeting, which I was attending, but I was keen to visit the obscure railway station where the young Gandhi, a Tony at law, was ejected from his first class compartment, the Dendi lawyer, 
Shoot, the Danilo suitcase thrown out in the chilly night of 7th June, 1893. In my mind, it was a place of pilgrimage from where many protest marches began. The lawyer, proud of his British law qualifications and his first class ticket, shivered on the platform until a white man invited him to come and sit inside a, inside a place doubtless exclusively reserved for whites only. The train left the station in the intensifying darkness, but sometimes on the wrong train, you reach the right destination or are destined to change the destiny of more than an empire. Gandhi calls it the most creative night of his life. He decided to stay in South Africa and start his Satyagraha against injustice and racial discrimination, disenfranchisement, practice against his migrated com compatriots who were denied basic civil rights. As a newly trained lawyer, he believed in the rule of law based on justice uh, to British subjects. He was an ardent admirer of the empire until he saw his, the inherent, its inherent evil corrupting both the ruler and the ruled. In the process, he invented the weapon of Satyagraha, the sole force, more powerful than any force in chain the empire itself. That fateful night was the most self-transforming moment, but it took exactly a century before the structures of apartheid were at least partially deconstructed. How did a shy, paid lawyer acquire such miraculous transformation in a century of genocide and unimaginable horrors? Gandhi grew up and devised methods by which men and women he proclaimed should shape and live their lives of peace and ahimsa, love in action, while, composing in, uh, while opposing injustice of any kind or color in any country or any community. But one had to be just in fighting injustice. Mohandas Gandhi's childhood was rich in rituals and customary observance, observation, observances performed daily by, the, by his mother, the fourth wife of his father. Gandhi never forgot the spiritual acts of his mother and how she sacrificed herself to care for others. She left the indelible mark on young Gandhi through her fast and devotions that remained part of his life of service, selflessness, and sacrifice until his dying moment. The Gandhi household was full of visitors from almost every faith. They often prayed together in the same sacred space. Although young Gandhi was not impressed by the conversion practice at that time by the Christian missionaries, his closest teenage friend was the Muslim boy. Though born in a Hindu household, Gandhi's faith resonated with several other faiths Jainism, which is older than Buddhism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and elements of Islam. Later, his closest friend in London, in South Africa, and India, were Christians and Jews. So his Hinduism was deeply ecumenical. The three branches spread in many directions in the wind and rain of life, where he heard the still said music of humanity from every direction. The world was often stormy with lightning and thunder, and Gandhi loved being in the midst of it all. But he believed that, the, that, that only falling rain really makes things grow. His longest journey was always inwards, and this led to the small voice within him. He called it the voice of his God, and it became the anguished cry of the dumb millions. He writes, uh, he wrote, we can only pray if, if, you are, if we are Hindu, not that a Christian should become a Hindu, or if we are Muslim, Muslim not that a Hindu or Christian should become a Muslim, nor should we even secretly pray that one should be converted to our faith, but our innermost prayer should be that a Hindu should be a better Hindu, a Muslim a better Muslim, and a Christian a better Christian. That is the fundamental truth of fellowship. And all religions, he said, are true, and all scriptures are divine for one's faith, he declared. Out of the creatively critical synthesis of so many spiritual strengths, he had made his own. He had made his own. He spun a large, bulky homespun 
woolen shawl. At first, it looks very plain to the eye in Professor Jordan's delightful image, but we can detect the beauty of the strong patterns and the contrasting shades of folk art with its knots and unevenness, it feels first rough to the touch, but soon we can experience how effective it is in warming cold and hungry rooms. Gandhi wrapped his frail body in his homespun shawl and gave to an age the ageless message, the reality of the divine within and without every life. He lived it daily as daily as our daily bread. The Gita became his rather tall walking stick, which he, which he interpreted with character, characteristic originality and often walked alone, leaning on his lati, the stick towards infinity. How did he become the great soul, Mahatma, a title he never felt home in? Gandhi was deeply influenced by Jane Powett. His ethical conduct from, a Buddh, from Buddhism Exaltation of service from the Christian friends, individual dignity and ideas of justice and equality of human rights through the enlightenment, he was very widely read. But he also had a Hindu sensibility. In the widest sense of the term, he believed that Hinduism was the world's most hospitable religion. He rejected the idea that there was only one privileged path to go. He was well versed in all religious texts and saw, him, saw them as men made, emphasis on men, a mixture of the truth and error. If one text was holy, then the others should be, uh, others were equally sacred. All religions were rivers flowing in the same seas that girded Mother Earth, of which Mother India was an integral part. He believed that we should stick to the faith we were born into, but ceaselessly improve its truth content in the light of new knowledge and interfaith dialogue and our actions in our daily lives. No religion had the exclusive right to truth or to God. And if a sacred text written by men revealed by an, by, or revealed by an angel had things that didn't stand to reason or to one's moral sense, it should be thrown like a rotten apple, that's his image. Hence his rejection of untouchability, which some felt was sanctioned by some holy mantras to the advantage of the unscrupulous men and some women. Years in jail gave him time, not only to read, but write prolifically. His works have now been published in 100 volumes on so many subjects that it boggles our mind today. You are the journalist par excellence. It is in his act of writing that he reached the most compassionate truths as Christ does when he says to the mob after writing on the ground, he that is without sin amongst you, let him first cast a stone at him. The acts of writing became for Gandhi his deepening conscience, that still small voice that makes heroes or cowards of us all. Many educated people, opposed the, his ideas of religion. The secular socialists thought he was a medieval man. Muslims saw him primarily as Hindu, as a Hindu, and the Orthodox Hindus saw him as denying the very essence of India as essentially a Hindu continent. And Christians felt he should convert to attain, he should convert to attain salvation through the light of Jesus Christ. But he defied everybody. Gandhi believed in the commonwealth of religions. And his conception of religious pluralism was a gift to the idea of India as a modern nation, as how Hinduism may transcend and transmute its subcontinental boundaries into the human soul without boundaries. The fact that Paul Bandar, Gandhi's birthplace, was a port on the Arabian Sea must have contributed to this openness. Seas are different from deserts. There are always possibilities of sailing beyond the shores, or the ships may be coming from somewhere else. The waves tell us there is another world, but it is in this one. Explore endlessly, fellow travelers. Islands have different horizons. 
it's a, it, it is significant that Australia is an island continent washed by two oceans and several seas. Maybe there is hope still for us. It is equally notable that Gandhi created farms and ashrams, but not temples. His whole vision of religious service was opposed to the orthodoxy prevailing in the caste obsessed, communally charged, imperially subjugated atmosphere of his times, controlled by the guns of the most militarily powerful empire, wherein many Indians were complicit with their petty privileges. Age 90, he had arrived in London for what he imagined was, very, was the very center of civilization. Though he was outcasted from his community for crossing the Kalapan Black Waters, there was no city like London in the mind of Indian and the colonized elite, including from Australasia. But from the beginning, he was a rebel with many causes and no causes. He took a bow in front of his mother that he won't touch me, uh, meat, wine, and women, despite occasional temptations and persuasions by more experienced Indian Londoners, he kept his vow. His meeting with the Vegetarian Society in London influenced him as did the teachings of the Theophist group, Theosophist group in, group. in, the, in those formative years, he imbibed the values and ideals of simplicity, purity, poverty, truthfulness, and love of people, indeed for all life, and met some remarkable individuals. His interest developed from diets to deities, from sanitation to salvation. For the first time, he began reading Hindu scriptures in English translation. Gandhi wanted to be a poet too. Luckily, he escaped the fate and became a saint. But he was profoundly influenced by the Jain poet Rajan Bhatt and also by the writings of Leo Tolstoy, especially the kingdom of God is within you, and the works of others like Ruskin's Unto This Last and Follow, and others, many others. While he didn't convert to Christianity, he moved closely with Christians, and no, and no one he loved more than Reverend Charlie Andrews. The Sermon on the Mount, he said, went straight to my heart. What Jesus preached, Mahatma Gandhi, lived in his much longer life. Later in his book, Hind Swaraj, published in 1909, written in nine days, he expressed the germinating philosophy of service and the spiritual power of the soul and delineated the disastrous course of modern mechanical Western civilization inimical, inimical to the soul of man or woman, alien to the life that Christ had talked about. Uh, a century later, one can see how prescient were some of his perceptions. The book was written as an argument against the budding terrorists in London. Not long after, all who one began. One has simply to look around to see what we have done to our wounded world in less than a century since Gandhi preached and practiced his philosophy of Ahimsa and Satyagra to right the wrongs of our fellow men and women. There was enough for the need of everyone on the earth, but not enough for the greed of even one, he said. The earth that produced daffodils, wattles, also had uranium in it. Hence his famous comment when asked what he thought of Western civilization, he replied, it would be a good idea. Uh, one can give a lot of witty remarks that he made about walking as a half-naked fakir, as Churchill had described him to meet the king emperor of, of the world. And Gandhi, when the journalist asked him, but Mr. Gandhi, are you going to meet the king emperor of the world dressed as a half-naked fakir? He said, don't you worry, my friend, the emperor will be wearing, be wearing enough clothes for both of us. And we have seen some of it recently on our television. Uh, the, the other point was then Salt March in 19 was a huge success. Nobody paid any attention to it, just a handful of people. And then it became the most powerful movement. Then finally the viceroy was forced to invite him to the vice regal palace in New Delhi. And Gandhi went there and the viceroy out of courtesy gave him a cup of tea and said, Mr. Gandhi, would you like some sugar? 
And Gandhi smiled at him and said, no, a pinch of salt will do. So and I can give you many examples, but Abraham won't give me the time. But he believed, Gandhi believed, People can change and one can even melt the heart of a tyrant with courage and suffering. There is no place for cowardice in life. If it comes to violence, he said, shed the blood, but it should be your own, nobody else's. Picture. When G.B. Shaw, when Shaw, remarked to Gandhi that vegetarianism has no appeal to the tiger, Gandhi replied, he did not believe that the British are all tiger and no man. Gandhi's agitation against the indenture system, of course, because I come from Fiji, so I know that I will not go into that. I'll simply leave that for another occasion. Gandhi's belief led to a unique understanding of religion and politics. They were the Siamese twins in public life, and the life was in the, and that all life was indivisible. By separating our morality from political responsibility, we felt we were absolving ourselves from the actions of our fellow human beings. It was an easy way out, despite the national idea. By, by imagining politics and ideas of religion, Gandhi had brought forth a new weapon of liberation of India from the imperial rule. He continued to redefine the very concept of power, developing through violence of thought, word, and deed. And one of the viceroys writes about him and says, this is a very dangerous man because every time we offer him an honor or a great home to live in, he rejects it all. He doesn't take it. And such men, the English had not encountered anywhere else because if somebody who gave a little honor or a knighthood or MBE, they would do anything for you. They would shoot house hundreds of people, even in Jalian Wallabad. And if you read about the most horrific of incidents in human history, where almost a thousand people were killed and many thousand Hindus, not many hundreds Hindus, out of 1,560 bullets, uh, only a handful of the bullets missed their mouth. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the irony of it all is that except for G General Reginald Dyer, every other soldier there who was firing these shots was Indian. This is the irony of the whole situation and he was so well trained, but it had consequences. The more he insisted on the symbolism of Rama Rajya, the more alienated sections of the community felt with the treacherous connivance of the Raj. All he had in mind when he talked of Rama Rajya was the dharma enshrined in the epics by which the universe exists both in the Atman and Brahman. And when that dharma, the balance of life that makes things grow, is disturbed, then, of course, tragedy strikes humanity. Britain, Britannia did at that time rule the waves, but often waived the rules to her convenience in the largest colony in India. But Gandhi was interested in the quality of action for the liberation of India and ultimately the liberation of the people in a country's soul. Even Joe Biden's slogan today is saving the soul of a man, though he gets Trumped often. The other day I bought a book from the National Library, just been published. It's called The Soul of uh, the Nation about Australia. So it is a concept that I think is coming back into our vocabulary. His most disastrous opposition came from the orthodoxy of Hinduism, fossilized over millennia with texts and ruled by castes and priests and scriptures. He knew. You do not create untouchability of millions overnight. The satanic verses which sanction these in any religion must be deleted. Fasting, celibacy, vows, oaths, actions, all concentrated towards one aim, liberation for millions. God, soul, truth may not be visible, but they exist in one form or another. What ceremonies we have, been, uh, we have seen recently on our own television screens, as Her Majesty passed on, uh, they were so religiously oriented. With bits and pieces from many scriptures, he built his nest on the speaking human tree and with many branches, but one trunk and many invisible and visible roots. He didn't claim any divinity for himself. 
but believed that the divine was within every living thing, hence ahimsa. Ahimsa simply means love in action. It was personal transformation and salvation that he believed in. And he felt that every individual had the power within to reach the highest ideals of his or her belief. His fasts, silences, writings, uh, political actions were all designed to take him deeper into the world of human affairs, not away from it. From fighting without bitterness, the mighty empire to the curse of untouchability in his backyard. The miracle is that he succeeded in doing so much so peacefully. And he also saved millions of people through his fasts and tours of the mutilated streets of Delhi and the corpse to jungles of Bengal just before he was shot dead. He saved more lives, according to Mount Breton, late Mount Breton, than the armies of the Raj. But his religion was not of this world. He left behind no isms. It was not all. Of, it was all about his heart, humanity, and hope, and an unfailing sense of humor. No saintly soul had this sense of humor. That is the uniqueness of the man who became the Mahatma. Gandhi showed and lived that the most enduring fact of life is not material achievements, the broken empires, but the evolution of the human soul in search of the meaning of living in union with the spirit of the universe. To be true, to be simple, to be pure and gentle of heart, to remain calm and cheerful in suffering, not to fear dying, to serve the spirit and not to be haunted by the spirit of the dead to live and let live and to love through Ahimsa and see the face of God face to face. He tried to give it a sense of concrete reality but through concrete actions. Perhaps Gandhi's idea of a spiritual view of life was akin to the original version of the world with its song lines and countries of the soul and the spirit that dwells within us and in our environment that there has not been a significant Gandhian movement in our, on our continent here remains a mystery to me. Mahatma Gandhi had learned a lot from the oldest continuous culture on our damaged planet. He taught us how to protest in peace and be 